Okay, let's try that. Well, there we go. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, how are we this evening? Good. It's good to see all of you. Um, I hope my hair looks okay. When Pastor Jerry prays over you, he don't care anything about your hair. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I didn't say it. (laughs) Um, The message for this evening is one that will hopefully be easy to grasp, even if it's not so easy to swallow at some points of the evening. But it's one that's going to correlate an analogy that's given to us in the Word of God and also like a real-life event that we're all familiar with. And it's a message that can span across the gamut no matter where we're at in our lives because that's what God words. God's word does. Amen. Um, Whether it's his word found in scripture, whether it's his word that is the preached word or the spoken word, it reaches us where we're at. It meets us where we're at. It speaks to us where we're at. And it challenges us to not stay where we are at. Amen. And so that is his word. So there are going to be some pictures that you're going to see, which are beautiful. I'm just going to give you a heads up. Um, as we go into the message this evening, but the title of the message is A Beautiful Bride for a Loving Bridegroom. And so, as most of you know, the Hubs and I's daughter, Kennedy, got married this weekend, and so you're going to see some pictures of that and of my baby girl, because she's going to be up there. But um, her and her fiancé were married this past Saturday, and I've told many that it's my favorite wedding I've ever been ever been to, like even more so than my own. (laughs) But um, it was just, everything about it was so beautiful from beginning to end. And um, I don't know, it was just breathtaking. And so not just seeing it all come together, not just all the hard work and the planning coming together, it was beyond that, not just the fact that, you know, our favorite people were there or that they got to have people surrounding them that loved them, but just the meaning of it all and the presence of God during it all and the knowledge of knowing that it was all done according to his will and his statutes, which are set forth for his children's lives. And that's a beautiful thing, especially in today's society. And so as with any wedding, there was great preparation that went into it, right? And so um, there was preparation by the bride, and I I have different titles for this evening, okay? So we're going to go through them, and you're going to see a correlation between a wedding, any wedding in American society, okay? I'm just happening to use my daughters, because why not? And... um, but also the correlation with scripture that we see for ourselves as the bride of Christ and with Jesus being the bridegroom, okay? And so there was preparations by the bride, all right? Not just since becoming engaged last August to Matthew, okay? But her entire life, there were preparations. And I want us to correlate this with our spiritual lives as well, okay? But there was preparation on the inside, okay? That she will be 25 years old in August and She lived in purity, and she readied herself, and she became what God would have her to be so that she could then be what she needed to be to be a helpmate to her husband when God prepared him and put them in each other's path to meet each other and to fall in love. And so her entire life on the inside has been a time of preparation, but there's also been a time of preparation on the outside for years long in her life because, as I say, she's going to be 25 in August, She has had an album in her phone titled Wedding Dresses since she was 15. And it's just like one of her favorite things would just be to pick out favorite wedding dresses. And and she knew designers and styles and all of this. And and she liked to say, like, the dress she ended up with was everything she didn't want in a dress, which I think is just great. You know, she didn't want poofy and she didn't want princess and she didn't want this and she didn't. And then when she put it on, she like instantly cried and That was the one, you know, and it was everything that she thought she didn't want. But her entire life has been a preparation for this, just as ours should be in becoming the bride of Christ, right? And so this planning that has taken place over the last 10 months of her and Matthew being engaged, okay, 
was planning with painstaking detail, all right, every aspect of the wedding and every aspect of the reception and doing all of that from Haiti where she lives because she's a school teacher there. So the details and the decorations and the frames and the trunks and, and that's why I wanted pictures especially so that you guys can see like details, okay, um, suitcases and old typewriters and a card table that, or card table, a cake table that was an old Singer sewing machine that she bought in an antique store and put flowers outside of the, the drawers of it and just like painstaking detail to every single thing that there was, okay? Um, the backdrop for the photos being just the perfect chair that she had pictured in her mind and her daddy spent hours perusing Facebook to find like, is this the style you want? Is this the right chair? Did I do good here? Did I, no, I wanted a little more this or I wanted a little more this. And, and then her brother Gabriel and I travel into PA because we finally found, if you see like the cream colored chair, like we finally found the right chair that was in her head, you know? But um, just so much detail and I could spend 10 minutes just on flowers and, and her learning every detail about flowers. She's a lot like my husband in that, that when she learns about something, she learns everything there is to know about it. So she learned types of flowers and colors and, and where you get flowers from and artificial flowers versus real. And she even learned about suppliers in Ecuador. And, and I didn't know that's where most of our flowers come from. And, and just all of these kind of things that she put into detail. Okay, And these were preparations that were made by her. But then there were also preparations being made by the groom too, weren't there? And so there were preparations made by Matthew. He was her legs and her wheels because she was in Haiti and he was here in Southington. And so she would buy all these detailed things on buy, sell trades. And then she was like, okay, now I need you to drive here and be there at this time to pick up this. And now I need to, and the poor kid, he drives like a Honda Civic, you know, and there were times where he's trying to like fit this stuff in his car. And, and so there was that preparation, okay? But then... There was also his desire within himself, and this is the part that I love when we think of how it correlates to, to what Christ does in our lives, is he had this great desire to get the apartment that they were going to live in all ready before she came home. And she got to come home at the beginning of May, and, and she was going to stay in the apartment until they got married, and then obviously he would move in after the honeymoon. And so he wanted to have that all ready for her, all ready. He wanted to have gotten the work done and provided the place for her and all of that. And we see this same thing in Scripture as well. And so I want you to see, like, the correlation of this and, and what our union in Christ is like in the same way or what it's supposed to be like, okay, in just like Matthew, who was the bridegroom on Saturday, okay, preparing a place for them to live, Jesus, also referred to as the bridegroom in Scripture, has gone to prepare a place for us as well, hasn't he? And it's found in Scripture, it's found in John chapter 14, and he's talking to his disciples there, and, and he's just got done washing their feet and, and showing just true servanthood and, and what that looks like to them. And then he says, "'Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions,' another translation says, "'rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go there to prepare a place for you.'" Verse 3, and if I go to prepare a place for you, here it is, this is our promise, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Verse 4, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas, how do we know? We don't know. And he tells him in verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so he goes to prepare a place for us, and he's getting it all ready, and if he goes to do that, and we know that's where he is now, he's going to come back, and he's going to get us and take us to be with him, right? And so we see here, and Jesus is telling his disciples, okay, that he goes to prepare this place for us. It's this perfect example of how we, okay, as Gentile Christians, okay, we miss a lot if we just read scripture and not study scripture. It's great to read scripture if you don't already. If you've been reading scripture for a long time, you got to get past reading scripture. And you got to start studying it, guys. It's not just for the pastors to, to give it to you, okay? you got to start studying it for yourself. And there's so much that we miss. And there's stuff even in this that we miss that they understood. Because the why? 
They were Jews, right? And so when he's speaking to them, they understood what he was saying, okay? Because according to Jewish custom, all right, and tradition, the bridegroom would go away. And the soon-to-be bride would be left with a time to prepare herself, okay? This is the same thing we see with um, Mary and Joseph. If you were in Mercy Manor last night, my mom, Reverend Joyce, mentioned this as well. You know, this is... Mary was betrothed to Joseph. They weren't married yet. It was like they were engaged, okay? But they were betrothed to each other. They were promised to each other. And so then Joseph is supposed to go and prepare this place and then come back and get Mary. And in the meantime, Mary gets pregnant. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh, right? But this was Jewish custom. This is how it worked out, okay? And so then she would not know when he was returning. The bride didn't know. The bridegroom would be betrothed to her. He would work things out with her family. We'll get into that in a few minutes. He would leave to go and prepare a place for her. And in that time frame, she would get herself ready. And she didn't know when he was going to come back. And she had to be ready when he came back. Do we see this? The correlation to this, okay? And this could take us into a whole other area with like the ten virgins and the parable about that. That might be for another week. Maybe I already know what next week's going to be now. I don't know. Okay, but not for tonight. But then there were preparations of the bride. So we talked about preparations by the bride and preparations by the bridegroom, okay? But there were preparations of the bride as well. Okay, so she didn't know when he was going to be returning, okay? And it was just when he had finished preparing the place for her. That's all she would know. And therefore, she had to be sure that she was ready when he came back. And this shows us, um, just as in our culture today, preparing for a wedding, okay, it doesn't happen when the wedding day approaches, right? Is that the day you prepare? No, no. Like, if you waited till the wedding day to prepare, you're not prepared, <laughs> right? Now, think of that in terms of when Jesus comes back. If you wait till that day to prepare, you're not prepared, okay? And so, when it finally arrives, okay, you have put preparation into it. You have put time and work and energy and study and, and attention to detail into everything, so that you're ready when he comes back. And as you see that day approaching, how many times in Scripture, as you see that day approaching? Okay, Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but encouraging one another. What? And all the more as you see that day approaching. Do we see it approaching? It's approaching faster than it ever has. Okay, it's coming up over the next horizon. It's like a freight train on its way to meet us, right? And so we have to make sure that we have prepared for that. And the more time or the more preparation that there needs to be, the more time you need. But guess what? Time is the part that we don't get to dictate. Time is in his hands, right? It says in Psalms, my times are in his hands. He's the one that dictates that. So I can't dictate how much time I have. So I have to dictate how much preparation I'm going to do with the time that I have left, correct? Okay, so we see this in Revelation in chapter 19, okay, the diligence that we need to have in preparing. And so we're going to read verses 7 through 9. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, or bride, has made herself ready. Verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, Clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do we know that that's where we're going to end up after all this is done? Between being betrothed to him and being raptured by him or his, him coming back for us, then guess what? Before that second coming, we get to partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's what this is talking about. And so the Lord's return is imminent, and it's closer than we've ever seen it before. But it's important to note that according to this scripture, that Christ's bride will have made herself ready. Did you catch that? Made herself ready. Not God did it all for me. She made herself ready, okay? 
Did my husband do all this work for Kennedy? No, she made herself ready. Did my husband smack her around and tell her, her daddy smack her around and tell her, you better keep yourself until you're married, da, da, da? No, she made herself ready. She kept herself pure. She did those things the proper way. Now, with us, as we see the Lord's return imminent, okay, we know that this preparation is something that we do ourselves. And in light of that, we have to ask ourselves, will he find us ready? Or will he find us slumbering in our comfort? Will his bride be spotless, or will she be marred by the sins of the world? Will he return to find her worthy of these white robes of linen, or these white robes of righteousness, okay? Or will we have been defiled by the world, and as a thief in the night, he's going to catch us off guard? And so as followers of Christ, these are serious questions that we have to ask ourselves. And that's why I said the correlation might be easy to grasp. Some of the stuff that's going to be spoken is going to be hard to swallow, okay? Now, we get to another aspect of a wedding, which is cost. Wow. (laughs) Can I just say wow? (laughs) But in most cases, as with our family, okay, there was a great cost for this wedding to take place, right? Anybody who's ever thrown one, especially for a girl, all of y'all that have boys, wow, okay? You get off so, or next to our boys, so we're good, okay? But this was our baby girl, wow, all right? And so, according to our culture, the great cost is incurred by what? The bride's family, okay? And so, it was incurred from the hubs, Kennedy's daddy, daddy, I need money, (laughs) daddy, this costs this much, okay, leading up to this past Saturday, but he paid that cost, what, gladly, and why did he, because he loves her, that's it, that's daddy's girl, he loves her, that's his baby girl, okay, from the time she was little, he called her babagoo, I don't know where it came from. But anyway, that's how she is in his phone, okay? And she would call him Pumbaa, and he would call her Babagoo. I don't know where it came from. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. Okay, but, like, that's daddy's girl. And so he paid the cost gladly, and he worked the overtime gladly, and he did the side jobs gladly because he loves her. He paid the cost for the wedding. He paid the cost For the bride's part, because he loves her. Do we get it? And likewise, there's a great price that needed paid for each and every one of us to become the bride of Christ. And could we pay it on our own? We couldn't pay it on our own. Our Heavenly Father paid much. And it was the bride price of sorts in order to have us, okay, and to be able to have us as his own, okay, and to have us present at that wedding supper of the Lamb. And what is this bride price that was paid? It was paid by the life of his own son, right, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so just as Kennedy's daddy played, paid that price gladly, okay, because of his love for her, the same is the reason behind the payment being made on our behalf by our Heavenly Father as well. It's John 3.16, right? What is it? It's his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because he's so loved, he paid that price. He paid the price of sending his son. His son paid the price by giving his life, by giving his blood for her, the bride, which is us, right? Wow, what a beautiful plan. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at something for a minute. Before we come to Christ, who is it that's our father? The enemy of our souls, right? It says, one well, house can't have two masters. You either serve one or you're serving the other. And if we're not serving God yet and we're not under the blood yet, guess what? Whether you like to admit it or not, the enemy is our daddy at that point. Okay? The enemy of our souls. And so it's either God or it's the enemy And so, before being redeemed by Christ, we belong to another. And we need bought back from him. 
okay? We belong to the enemy, and so many of us think of it as a dowry, okay? But it's actually more accurately a bride price that needs paid to buy us back from the one who is our father at that time, which is the enemy, all right? And that bride price paid for us, it took... God providing that bride price, his son, his son's blood, in order to buy us back from the enemy of our souls who was also the one who was our father at that time. Do we see that? Yeah, his very life given for us. So in that bit of Jewish culture that I mentioned, okay, a few minutes ago of how the bridegroom would go to prepare a place for the bride, guess what? He didn't go to do this until he had already paid the bride price for her to her father. What has Jesus already done? He's already paid that price to our father, the one that we were living our lives for before. He's already done it, and now he goes to pay. When they heard all of this from him, it was like light bulbs going off to them because this was their culture. They understood this. To us, we're like, okay, he's using another one of them analogies. Like, it's like a parable, like all is it? No, it made so much sense to them, okay? So Jesus came to earth. He paid the bride price for us, which was his very life, okay? He's gone to prepare a place for us, just like he speaks about to his disciples in John 14. And when the time is right, when the fullness of the time has come, he's going to return, Okay, it's what's referred to as the rapture. You're not going to find that in Scripture. That word is not in there. There's lots of words. Trinity isn't in the Bible. Rapture it isn't in the Bible. Okay, they're just words that we use. Okay, but that time is going to come. That rapture of the saints is going to happen. He's going to step his foot on the cloud, and the trumpet's going to sound, and the voice of the archangel, and then what? Those that are dead in Christ are going to rise, and those that remain are going to be taken up in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to be forever with him. Ah, hallelujah. Is that what we're looking forward to? Yeah. So the bridegroom has went to prepare a place for us, and when he's done, he's going to come back. And when he does, we have to be ready. It doesn't matter if we fall on the ground, if we fall on our face before him, if we bow our knee to him, if we waller and, and grovel and cry and everything else. If we're not ready, we're not ready. But the cost aspect is so important for us to grasp, okay? Because God loved his creation so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for her. And Christ loved her so much that he gave himself up for her. That's what scripture tells us. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Further down in the same chapter, chapter 5, in verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then it tells us why he did. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Wow. He gave her... Or he loved her and he gave himself because he did. He loved us. So he gave himself because he did. And he did it before we chose him. And he did it before we believed in him. And he did it before we cleaned up our mess. What did Wendy say tonight? When we're in the middle of our mess. That's when he did it. He didn't die for us on our best cleaned up day. He didn't die for me when I looked like this. He died for me when I looked like that, and I ain't about to tell you what I look like. <laughs> Prodigal son running down the road, right? While we were still seeking our own desires and lusts and goals and dreams and plans, that's when he died for us. While we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid that bride price for us while we were yet sinners. We didn't look like no bride. Huh. We looked like anything but. But he paid the bride price for us then when we didn't even look like a bride. Why? 
because he knew what we could look like. He knew what we would look like when we were washed and when we were cleansed and when we were renewed and when we were set free and when we were delivered and when we were made right. Huh. Second Peter chapter 3. We're going to read verses 9 through 15. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Verse 12, as you look forward to the day, we're supposed to look forward to it. We're not supposed to dread it. We're not supposed to be fearful of it. We're supposed to look forward to it. He says, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I want to live somewhere where righteousness dwells because I don't live nowhere where righteousness dwells right now. Amen. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, he said it three times already. Are we getting the point here? I didn't even catch this when I put this in here tonight. Okay, Peter, three times now he's already said it. Since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. He says, just as Paul has written to you already. Wow. So going on from there, we get to the marriage supper or the reception, as we always think of it, right? Now, Kennedy and Matthew wanted things small and intimate, okay? They wanted guests there that they knew well, not just acquaintances. They wanted to be able to have time going around to the tables and, and seeing everyone and, and to be able to be present and in the moment, you know? And so in keeping that guest list small, that was hard to do, you know, when you're thinking, okay, we only want 100 people there tops, and then you think, oh, that means we only get 50 because he gets 50. And then you try to narrow down your life to 50 people. Wow. When you've come from two churches and when your husband works and when you have family and then that's just us. And then it's like, oh, yeah, it's not our wedding. We already had one. This is your wedding. Who do you want to have there? <laughs> you know, and all of that. And so it's hard to keep a guest list small. Okay. But with God... He knows his creation well. What did Kennedy and Matthew want? They just wanted people there that they knew well and people that had known them well. But guess what? God knows all of us well because he created each of us, right? And so, therefore, everyone is invited because cost isn't an issue with God because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He didn't have to pay for the third meet at DVSDs. He just owns it all, right? And so he can invite everybody. So everybody's invited, but not everybody accepts the invitation. Huh. Guess what happened right before the wedding? We're like, oh, we haven't heard from like 10 people. I wonder if these 10 people are coming. Maybe I should reach out to them and see. I don't want to pay for them if they're not coming. Guess what God did? He paid for us all, whether we go or not, whether we accept the invitation or not, right? Hmm. All are invited, but not all of them are SVP. Not all of them accept that invitation, okay? And so with Kennedy's wedding, we had, we didn't tell everybody where they had to sit at the table, but we did make out tables with groups of people. And like, we put a lot of thought into it. Like, these people want to sit with these people, and we'll put that table close to this table so they can talk to each other. And we should probably keep this person away from this person. And you know how it is. <laughs> but we also had table number five. And table number five she was just joking when she said it, but mom is the one that typed up the table card. So I went ahead and put it on there because I liked it. And so you had this big board, and you had to find your name, and then you saw what table you sat at. But table five said, I didn't RSVP, but I need somewhere to sit. <laughs> and that's exactly what it said. And she was just joking, and I'm like, I'm putting it on there because that's the people that are going to need to sit at that table anyway. <laughs> they didn't RSVP, but they need somewhere to sit, right? Yeah. 
I'll go a step further. We even had one person that showed up and said, I wasn't invited, but I'm sure it was just an oversight because I think you would have really wanted me there and came anyway. And I'm like, I'm thinking of this message today as I'm writing it, and I'm like, where does that fit in Scripture? (laughs) What's that? The one without the wedding clothes. Oh, there you go. I didn't think of that. I'm like, I don't know how to make this one correlate, but I'm going to mention it anyway. But to accept the invitation, you have to surrender to his invitation. Listen to that. To accept his invitation, you have to surrender to his invitation. You have to accept his proposal to you. When Matthew got in the middle, we lived on Templeton Road at the time, and when he was taking a walk with Kennedy one August evening, he was visiting, she was home for the summer, and he's visiting, and they're just so cute, you know, and he spins her around, and as she's spinning, he hurries up and gets down on one knee. It's just so cute. And he pulls the ring out of his pocket, and he asks her to marry him. Guess what? She could have said no. Oh, that would have been awkward. (laughs) Right? We have to accept his proposal. He says, will you be my bride? Will you be betrothed to me? Will you live forever with me? Will you come to this wedding feast? You're invited. But we have the right to say yes or no, right? So we have to accept his proposal. And then we live our lives for him instead of ourselves, right? What does it tell us in Ephesians? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her, okay? Huh. So how are we supposed to live? We're supposed to be, as brides, we're a helpmate, right? He's made someone comparable, the New King James Version says. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make someone, every translation says suitable for him, except New King James Version says, I'll make someone comparable with him. But what? We complement each other and we help each other and we're in this together, right? Yeah. And so then we accept the proposal we accept the invitation, and then we have to prepare ourselves. And we have to live according to the instructions that are given to us, right? We have to dress appropriately. You know, there's some weddings that are, like, super fancy. We don't got it like that. We didn't have that kind of wedding, you know. But they'll even tell you, like, you have to dress this way. Well, guess what God's saying? You have to be clothed like this. You can't have spot and blemish and wrinkle on you, Okay? So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 32 actually gives us a heading called Instructions for Christian Living. Like, it doesn't get much more simple than that. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm supposed to live. Okay, then read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 32. Okay? He says, I tell you this and insist on it. In the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to the sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, speak truthfully to your neighbor, For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen." Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. And verse 32, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God in God forgave you. Wow, that's living ready. And that's a mouthful, right? 
and to be prepared and watchful for his return and to do so is like us living out an exchange of vows with him. So let's think of wedding vows for a moment, okay? And, and he's already done it, okay? He's already vowed to us. But now we vow back to him. So think of wedding vows for a minute. I, the bride, take you, Jesus, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, to have and to hold, to love and to cherish, forsaking all others. Put anybody else on the shelf with God, right? Have no other idols before me. Forsaking all others. How about even in death we won't part? But with all that I have and all that I am, I give you my vow. Hmm. Think of that. Wedding vow spoken to the bridegroom. He's already vowed them to us. He's already come into covenant with us. He's already said that that's what he wants. He's already betrothed himself to us. He's already paid the bride price for us. He's already went to prepare the place for us. He's already invited each and every one of us as his creation, and it's all paid for already. And all we have to do is be ready when he comes back to get us and to be clothed the way we're supposed to and to put off the old man and put on the new. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. So as we close in prayer tonight and the musicians come back up to play, I thought of this right at the end, but there's going to be different ones of us up here if anybody wants prayer individually. And when we pray for you, I brought anointing oil with me. And this anointing oil is actually called spikenard. And spikenard is the oil of worship and praise, but what it is, is it speaks of the bride's extravagant devotion to the bridegroom. And it speaks of the intimacy that she has with him. And it speaks of how she doesn't care what cost it is in surrendering